Lost in a multitude of numbers, graphs, and charts? No time to understand the effect of data, such as GDP, inflation, income statements, and cash flow on your investments? Unsure about what's happening to the economy? Don't know the good places to invest? Risk on with equities or risk off with fixed income? Investing nowadays can be overwhelming. There are so many terms to learn and so much data to analyze amidst a sea of investment opportunities. The Atrium Global Allocation Feeder Fund is designed to do exactly that. The fund is invested in both equities and fixed, combining the best ideas across the full spectrum of asset classes. Investing in equities that offer potential outperformance while using fixed income to protect against the downside, historically delivering more of the upside of global stocks compared to the downside. Flexible and diversified, it seeks the most attractive investment opportunities that give long-term growth while managing volatility. Portfolio managers and analysts will help you navigate across the sea of numbers, graphs, and charts to find you the most attractive investment opportunities while you can sit back and relax. All this, conveniently available whether you invest in Philippine peso or US dollars. Invest in a fund that gives you competitive returns with less risk. Invest in the Atram Global Allocation Feeder Fund. For more information, visit www.atram.com.ph. Almost everyone has at least one relationship with one financial institution. Practically all businesses, regardless of industry, require financial services at some point in time, be it credit cards, bank and time deposits, loans, insurance, or investments. But financials go beyond these. It evolves through technology, and rapid innovation has given birth to a long-term trend called fintech or financial technology. Fintech is a powerful trend. Electronic payments are steadily growing with a lot of room to grow exponentially. On top of this, we also have the of cryptocurrency and other blockchain technologies. With the Atrium Global Financials Feeder Fund, investors can participate in growth of companies around the world that are involved with providing financial services. The fund gives you access and diversification to global financial names that we normally do not have locally. The fund also invests in fintech, which a normal financials fund would not. Invest in the biggest global companies in the financial industry. Participate in the global recovery. Diversify your investment portfolio by investing in this fund. Invest in the Atram Global Financials Feeder Fund. For more information, visit www.atram.com.ph. The world around us is ever-changing. We are facing development challenges on a global scale. Today, 41 million out of 57 million deaths are attributable to non-communicable diseases. In the Philippines, 5 out of 10 families were deprived of basic education. The Philippines also ranked third in the top 10 countries with the most natural disasters. Women participation in the labor force is less than half at 48%, while male participation is at 77%. The United Nations identified and adopted 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs to address the challenges faced by economies, societies, and the environment. We at ATRAM support the UN and the SDGs by launching the ATRAM Philippines Sustainable Development and Growth Fund. The fund is designed to invest in Philippine companies that score high in terms of the integration of UN SDGs into their operations and strategy. Through this fund, we hope to encourage PSC-listed companies to integrate UN SDGs into their businesses. We must work together to make the world a better place. ATRAM Philippine Sustainable Development and Growth Fund. Invest in a sustainable future together. Invest to thrive. Invest to Together. For more information, visit www.atram.com.ph. Megatrends are shaping and influencing the global economy. Urbanization, technological innovation, resource scarcity, and demographic and social change. The long-term shifts in these trends create multiple investment opportunities. They gave rise to a new type of investing called thematic investing. Enter the Atrium Global Equity Opportunity Feeder Fund. The fund invests into the themes that would benefit the most today, making it the first global multi-thematic fund in the Philippine market. Unlike traditional investing, thematic investing is not constrained to sectors or locations, focusing instead on themes and megatrends. It distills the megatrends to find relevant topics that work in this current market environment. It finds the next big thing and invests in it at a very early stage. 
With this multi-theme fund, investors will have exposure to various companies that will drive future market growth. What's more, you can invest in all the new developments in this world in Philippine peso or US dollar, making it accessible to everyone. Invest in the fund that invests in the stories of tomorrow, today. Invest in the Atrium Global Equity Opportunity Feeder Fund. For more information, visit www.atrium.com.ph. Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this week's episode of the Atrium webinar series. I am Belle Marquez, Portfolio Solutions Manager and your host for today. For most of us, certainly, it must have been a very eventful first quarter. And in anticipation of what the next quarter or so bring us, we'll be having an interesting discussion today on the key insights on market trends, opportunities, and outlook in hopes it will shape your investment decisions individually or your respective business organizations. If you have questions, you may send them as early as now by clicking on the Q&A button found below your screens. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that this session will be recorded and that copies will be disseminated as well as posted on all our social media platforms. Also, please don't forget to visit our website. So that's www.atrum.com.ph for more detailed information about all the funds that we offer. Similarly, if you have any friends who you think would like this webinar but are unavailable to attend, feel free to share the YouTube replay of this session or visit our YouTube channel, Atrum Studio. Scan the QR code to visit all our official social media pages. We'd like to invite you as well to join Atrum's official Viber community group. So that's hashtag Atrum PH community to stay updated on the latest announcements, advisories, and reminders. Again, just scan the QR code or visit the link on your screen and get a chance to win Atro merchandise. We'd like this webinar to be as interactive as possible, so please don't hesitate to send your questions anytime in the Q&A tab as well as at any point in the webinar. Each question you send is a raffle entry for a chance to win limited Atro merchandise. Winners will be announced at the end of the webinar, so make sure to stay tuned until the end. We'll also be wrapping up with a quick feedback survey after the webinar, so we do hope you can share your thoughts with us about our session today and how we can further improve our webinar series. So with those out of the way, let me briefly introduce our speakers this morning. First is Mr. Carlos Navarro. Carlos is currently a portfolio manager in the Atrop Equities team. He was previously the portfolio manager for equities in the trust banking group of the second largest local bank in the country and has eight years of experience in the fund management industry. He also holds two masters because one's just not enough. <laughs> a master's degree. The first is a master's degree in management with the University of Asia and the Pacific. And the second is a master's degree in computational finance with De La Salle University, Manila. Also joining us today is Ms. Kyla Torres. Um, so she is an investment fund specialist, specialist for Atrum's multi-asset team. Um, so her role is really overseeing investment due diligence, analysis, and monitoring of the target funds of Atrum's range of feeder fund offerings, something surely everyone here is aware about. She graduated from Ateneo de Manila University in 2014 with a bachelor's degree in management economics. And last but definitely not the least is Atrum's very own Mr. Miguel Liboro. So Miguel is currently the head of local markets for Atrum. He completed the BAP Treasury Certification Program and was awarded the number one rank for six years running um, as the most astute investor in Asian currency bonds. So, but that's by the Asset Magazine and also awarded the most astute investor in Asian G3 bonds from 2018 to 2021. So now that we've introduced the members of Atrum's very competent and experienced team, we'll tackle our market and maybe start with each of the asset class part by part. But first of all, let me ask, hi, Miguel, Kyla, and Carlos, how you're all doing today? We're good, thank you. Yeah, Hope you are doing well. Thanks, well. <laughs> well. Doing well. 
Great. <laughs> Apologies for my slightly hoarse voice, but um, it's definitely can pull through here. So um, at this point, maybe let's start um, with Carlos um, to talk about the equities market and the strategies. Um, Carlos, it's been a very news heavy um, first quarter for all of us. Um, and I guess um, with what's obvious um, among those news, right? So we have the 2022 national elections. Um, second, the reopening story. I'm seeing a lot of people on the road or the rising inflation. Which of these three do you think will affect the market the most moving forward? Um, or either, is it going to be all of them? Yeah, I think all of those things will definitely have an effect on the market. Um, but if you're going to ask what's the what's the one factor that will trump all of the other factors, it's probably the reopening story. As we can see here in this slide, we are targeting 7,800 for the PSEI for year end 2022. And that's premised on a 17% earnings growth. Now that is, um, that is lower th than our initial target of 8,600. And as you mentioned, the reason why it's lower is because of the of the high inflation environment that we are seeing. So it's going to affect the margins of a lot of the companies. So that's why it's going to have a negative effect on the market. So all of the factors that you mentioned will definitely have an effect on the market. That's why we're seeing a lower index target of 7.8 from our initial target of 8.6, but still pretty decent gains. So what's this? What, what this is telling us is that although the high inflationary environment will have an effect on our market, the overarching factor that will still drive the market, that's why we're still expecting um, a 7,800 target, will still be the reopening story. I think that will be the fundamental driver of the markets for 2022. Although this will be tempered a bit by the high inflation environment, but still, it's not enough to fully offset the reopening story that we're seeing. Where, as you mentioned, your know, traffic has been bad lately. You know, the economy is reopening up. You see the malls. You see people going out and about. So that's really, and since two thirds of our economy are from consumer spending, that's really, I think, the fundamental driver for the markets today. And I think that will trump all of the other factors. And that's why we are still seeing 17% earnings growth for this year and still a decent upside of 13% from current levels to our target of 7,800 for year end 2022. Completely agree with you, Carlos. Um, the rise in oil prices, um, inflation in general with the um, prices of uh, meat, um, drinks, or our food, um, no one's stopping their rebellion <laughs> to spend. Yes, exactly. um, so it, yeah, so it's, it's a bit of a mix of environment, but good to know that um, as you said, there's still 13% upside on the equities market from where we are um, in the recent yesterday. Um, so because we have that outlook, um, though downgraded, but still quite positive from, yeah. from where we're going to start off today, can you share with us then um, what are your strategies for the second quarter? Yeah, sure. Um, we can share our strategies based on, on, our, based on our outlook. As mentioned a while ago here in this slide, we are expecting a 17% earnings growth. So our strategy will revolve around which stocks will drive that 17% earnings growth. And those drivers, those stocks that will drive the 17% earnings growth are those same stocks that we expect to outperform the market for 2022. So first, um, let's first tackle consumer discretionary because consumer discretionary is has one of the highest earnings growth for this year. And the one stock that we picked there in, in that sector will be Jollibee. Again, we are, we are aware of the inflationary environment that we are having right now. So it will impact, what it will impact the most will be the consumer, consumer companies. Uh, their margins will be affected. You know, there's URC, there's Monde, and of course there's Jollibee. So there will be a lot of of effect on, there's gonna be a lot of effect on the consumer companies. But, so we're gonna to have to be selective on the consumer discretionary front, and that's why we're choosing Jollibee. Now, the reason why we're choosing Jollibee is that, well, number one, we're expecting a 77% earnings growth for, for this year. And this is despite the high inflation. And also on top of that, uh, I think what's most important will be the pricing power. 
Jollibee has the most pricing power because it has a very strong brand equity, meaning that it is able to pass on these higher these higher costs that they have to their consumers a lot better than the other consumer companies simply because they have a very strong brand equity. And number two, they have a different cost base, for example, than URC or Monde, which will be, they, I think, um, those stocks, URC and Monde, I think will be the most affected in this high inflation environment. So given the different cost base of Jollibee, they have, they have chicken, uh, they, have, they have beef, they have pork, but for URC and Monde, they're more exposed to the commodity to the, to the commodities which actually spike um, for this year. So that's why I think with a different cost base, Jollibee is, will fare relatively better compared to other consumer, consumer companies like URC or Monde. That's why in the consumer discretionary space, we are selective and we are choosing Jollibee on that. And the next will be the property and the banking sector. Of course, this is a reopening story. So we're gonna have to choose cyclical companies. Companies that will companies that will drive the earnings growth, companies that will grow with the reopening story. And since the property and the banking sector are cyclical sectors, they are the perfect proxies for that. So to be more specific for the property sector, we're, we're very bullish on the mall segment. Foot traffic has increased a lot from, from the fourth quarter of 2021 and the first quarter of 2022. Um, given that there was an Omicron variant in January, it has slowly increased and recovered since then. So you got improvement in the foot traffic. And of course, this will lead to higher tenant sales and higher mall revenues for the malls. And for the residential segment, we're seeing construction capacities continue to improve to the point that we expect construction capacity in the residential segment to be at 100% of pre-COVID levels already as we close 2022. So there are a lot of positive signs in the property sector and in the banking sector. Loan growth, we expect it to be at 8 to 12 percent for the listed banks for, for 2022. Again, a big improvement from the flat earnings growth that the listed banks had last year. So there's just a lot of, um, a lot of individual drivers for the property in the banking sectors. And not to mention that the banking sector will be a beneficiary of the higher interest rate environment. So there's a lot to look forward to. And I think that um, those two sectors, the banking and the property sector, plus select consumer companies like Jollibee are good, uh, are good proxies to be in if we want to be exposed to the reopening story. So that will be our strategy. Well, not only for the second quarter, but for the rest of 2022. Very lots of news to munch there, um, Carlos. But just to summarize, um, we do like the banking and property because yes. banking obviously always um, at, take advantage of um, a an, an high inflationary or rising rate environment. Um, property, of course, it's very obvious. We're seeing so many people on the malls, um, on the street, and even um, construction. So yes, lots of residential construction happening. And selective on consumer discretionary because again, rebellion spending. Um, but we're targeting... Um, um, we do like Jollibee because, again, of brand equity, and they're less um, price sensitive to commodities as maybe the other names. Yeah. So I hope I, I capture that um, quite well. And yes, um, of course, the full sectors, these are just our preference. Um, um, of course, others may perform definitely, but this is just where we're eyeing. Um, on that, actually, on the consumer discretionary or the activity generally of people now um, enjoying level one quite a bit too much, um, <laughs> there is news on a new COVID variant. Um, I believe, uh, so yesterday, um, there's a singular case of the new variant um, yeah. found in the Philippines weeks ago. So how likely is then a new surge? Um, and how are we expecting that to impact markets? Yeah, I think that there could probably be a surge given the new variant and given that I think the experts in the medical community have been communicating that we should expect a surge probably by May. Uh, I, in terms of impact on the markets, uh, let's first tackle on, on the virus itself. I think the natural evolution of the virus would be for it to become less and less severe as it evolves but it becomes more transmissible. But this is a positive, a positive development on our side because the only thing that we want is for healthcare capacity to remain manageable. And if it's less severe, then 
I think that the economy will able to weather that. So I think in general, the impact on the economy and the market will be will be a lot less than before. We have ad- we have adapted already to the new normal. We know how to how to move and go about when when there's a new COVID surge to the point that mobility isn't really it's relatively less affected than before. So we have really been able to adapt. And in terms of impact to the markets, we've seen the impact to become less and less. For example, from the from the um, from the first time that we had the lockdown in 2020, and then the Delta variant and then the Omicron variant, the impact on the market has become less and less as we learn to deal with the eventualities of of this surge. I also don't think that there will be another lockdown like an ECQ or MECQ, um, given that if, even if there were a surge, um, as you mentioned. I don't think that that would be necessary as we have learned already to cope with these things. So in terms of impact to the economy and the market, while a surge may happen, I think that the impact would be relatively small, a lot smaller than before. And actually, I would take that opportunity if the market corrects to add on to our investments, if the markets do correct, because I believe this will be short term and I believe that the impact would be relatively small compared to before. Okay, so adaptability uh, makes it quite the right time um, to get into the market or add more if you're already yes, invested. That's Thank you, Carlos. So I'll circle back to you a bit later. Um, sure. Don't don't leave us just yet. So, <laughs> and thank you for sharing um, for our audience benefit how, what we're doing in the Philippine equity space. Um, so I'll move on next to fixed income. So let's call on the head of fixed income, Miguel Iboro. Miguel, sorry, I'm just counting. Um, you were seven times most astute investor. Um, apologies for that. Um, and we have gathered a few questions. Um, I'm sure our viewers as well will be interested to know more about. Um, I guess the first and quite the most um, looming, um, uh, I guess, issue that we are now facing is the interest rates, of course. So where will interest rates um, go, given there's a concern for inflation and also the U.S. Fed now hiking, though we um, know quite aggressively its expectation. So yeah, so where do you think interest rates will be going? Uh, that's, that's a good question, Bell. Uh, and I guess from before I take that on, what I want to Point two first is, if you guys see the chart in front of you, that's actually where the yield curve for local government securities was at the end of 2021 and where they were just at the end of, of March of the first quarter. And what you'll see is there was already a significant move higher. And it's because of the factors that you discussed, right? Um, so uh, there's a lot of text here. I should have kind of triggered it down more like Carlos, but I'm going to go through it really quickly. Um, bond supply has been one of the biggest reasons why uh, yields have been as high as they've been. Uh, The Treasury has continued to issue at their weekly auctions, and that's, of course, put pressure on yields to go higher, especially when you combine that with uh, the inflation fears that that you were discussing with Carlos earlier. Um, So let's take inflation first. Definitely, it has been going higher. We came down to around 3% early on in the year. We're back at 4%, the upper end of the BSP's 2 to 4% range. We think that there's definitely some pressure over the, over the short term, certainly over the second quarter, for inflation to keep pushing higher. Uh, and it's really on the back of uh, many things, but key of which is the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So as global oil prices have gone up and commodity prices in general have gone up, all those are input costs for the final goods and services that we, that we consume. And of course, as a net oil importer, that has really had an effect on uh, our inflation. But I think quite important to send the message that although inflation is expected to adjust a bit higher over the short term, I don't think that we're seeing necessarily the same levels of headline uh, headline growth there that we saw in 2018, where inflation was you know at six point at the high of 6.7% uh, back then. I certainly don't think at this point in time uh, that we'll be seeing those kinds of levels. Um, And because of that, again, taking the point you made earlier, although the U.S. Federal Reserve is expected to hike rather aggressively, we can talk about that a little bit more later, we don't think that the BSP will be moving in lockstep. Uh, They've said that they don't need to, and uh, and we believe them. Um, I think that, if anything, the BSP is likely to move by uh, 
around 50 basis points this year in two separate tranches of 25, which is pretty much what they've indicated with their recent rhetoric. Uh, really, there's no need to move in line with the Fed who are anticipated to hike anywhere from between six uh, to seven times potentially. So because of that, and because the market, as you can see from that graph there, has already gone ahead, interest rates have already adjusted higher. Uh, to your main question, where do I think interest rates are going? Uh, I think that because of inflation, there is some short-term pressure for rates to go higher. But I think that we're pretty much already there at these levels. Um, you know, the last time we were seeing five-year above 5% and 10-year above 6%, was back in 2018 or the first quarter of 2019. So uh, I think definitely there's some value right now, notwithstanding short-term inflationary concerns. Yes, I do have a question um, later on um, where we see the values at. Um, but so just to summarize, of course, with the bond supply and inflation fears, um, you are expecting rates to go up, uh, of course, but we will not follow um, directly what fed is doing we usually do um so we're expecting fed to hike about six to seven more times but for us um two tranches of 25 basis points um, is our expectation and you touched on inflation um quite a bit there miguel so the bsp i think recently released a revised um inflation estimate um i think they moved it up to 4.3 percent what do you think were the factors they considered um in that revision and i guess you did say you were expecting inflation to accelerate and um, is there a risk further there um, at what point do will we see it normalize um, well i think the biggest consideration was really the spike in global oil prices back to above 120 peaking early on at around the 130 level before coming off a bit uh, and unfortunately we do expect uh, global oil prices to stay elevated i think around the 100 to 105 uh, dollars uh, per barrel of crude range throughout the year. So that's unfortunately not going away. Um, that was probably the main consideration. As I mentioned earlier, the input costs are rising as a result of that, uh, that key move. And it's not all negative, though, on the supply side. Uh, I think going back to what Carlos said earlier, some of the inflationary movement has been uh, the good kind, meaning demand-driven. As we've reopened the economy, uh, we've had a lot of, uh, I guess, revenge spending. We've had people kind of consume more and more, try and get back to their more normal habits. And that's been part of what's been pushing it also. So it's a combination of those two things. Um, I do think, as I mentioned, that there is scope for inflation to push higher over the short term. I think that we could get as high as um, maybe four and a half over the coming months. I, I don't... I don't know yet if we'll get as high as 5%. It's certainly in the cards. But again, um, I think that it would be temporary in nature. And unless there is really a significant uh, escalation in you know, geo the geopolitics in Russia, Ukraine, kind of forcing oil prices even higher and sustaining that high, um, I don't think that we will stay at these elevated levels of inflation that we're we're afraid of seeing. And I do think that uh, by the end of the year, we will be within uh, the BSP's 2 to 4% range, probably closer to within 35 to 4 but okay. still within the range. Okay, at least not 20, 2018, 2019 levels. Um, and of course, uh, understandably, uh, BSP probably looked at commodities because as Carlos said earlier, we are um, a very heavy net um, importer of commodities. So if that moves up, um, makes sense that they also use that as a revision for, for the inflation estimates. Um, and you mentioned Ukraine and Russia conflict. Of course, when we started the year, I remember when we were doing one of our huddles, um, we didn't know where to price it in. Is it going to be a long-term war, short-term war? So looks like it's going on for quite some time. Um, so on that note, Miguel, um, are there any long-term effects um, that we probably need to expect from the Russia-Ukraine um, conflict? Wow, okay. That's, yeah, that's, we probably need the whole webinar for that. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try and like look at, I guess, the, the broader picture. Um, I think definitely... Because, as you said, there, it doesn't look like a, a resolution is in sight, unfortunately. I think the best we can hope for is that it's contained and that there's no uh, significant escalation over the coming, over the, over the remainder of the year. Uh, and then we can kind of revisit it. But I think the, 
longer, the shorter term implication is again, uh, commodity prices are likely to stay elevated. I don't know if they'll keep breaking towards new highs or above the recent highs, but certainly stay elevated. The longer term implication, of course, is what does this mean from uh, an energy dependent standpoint? Because the US, you know, kind of moved towards fracking, you know, over the last five, 10 years when they did, I guess, have enough foresight to see that they might have conflict with Russia, China. But Europe is still entirely dependent on bulk of their oil coming from Russia. And now you're being seen, you've been seeing that used uh, as, of course, a weapon in this economic kind of war, right? So I think that longer term, the implication is that this is sending a message to the Western European nations that we got to find another way. We can't be so dependent on these guys. So I, I guess for me, that's what I would like to highlight. From a longer term standpoint, there will be implications on the global stage as those nations try to answer that question. That's true, Miguel. Um, we've been more um, globalized um, and more dependent towards each other. Um, and as you said, Europe more than the U.S., um, probably because the U.S. expected it. Um, and for us, of course, being net importer of all of these um, things that are affected by the war, then, then that's also something that we probably have to keep an eye out on. So very insightful conversation, Miguel. I'll also get back to you um, with audience questions. I see a lot of it coming in. So don't go just yet. Um, but for now, I just like to keep reminding everyone that I see your questions coming in. Um, we do have a QA and a sec section afterwards. So uh, we'll keep receiving them and um, we'll get to them later. So thank you again, Miguel. And now let me call on Kyla. Um, so we looked at, um, of course, local equities and local fixed income, but we tackle global because um, again, we're, we're all uh, affected by anything that's happening with each other. Um, so Kyla, on the outlook for multi-asset, um, particularly for global, so I'll just start off. Um, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, hi, Bell. <laughs> Hello. Ready. Yes, so um, this is actually a common question I've encountered as well um, with our institutional clients. Um, given all that's happening, how do you see markets affected? Let's tackle first um, by the current fears on the Fed hiking. Well, I think um, as mentioned with the previous speakers, we're at a situation now where inflation is soaring. So price changes happen when there's an imbalance of supply and demand. The Fed can only control the demand side and not really the supply. And they can do so with their policy tools. So that's the hike or to reduce their asset purchases or tightening. Of, um, so far, um, most of this is being priced in the fixed income markets where we're now seeing an inversion of the yield curve or flattening. As the long dated bonds uh, rise slower, uh, the yields rise lower, which could indicate that raising rates may not be as needed in the future. And where short dated bonds reflect more of the policy changes currently, currently happening. On the equity side, we'll probably still see a bigger reaction down the road, although we're seeing some sell-off partly because of the war and inflation expectations. So once we see the pace of hiking take place, this can crimp down growth expectations with borrowing and input costs stemming higher. But what we can note is that the Fed's priority is stability. So if it sees that their rate hikes and tightening have already made an impact, um, we're expecting that they would eventually slow the pace of rate hikes. So basically, we're already seeing this again in the fixed income markets now, but I think there may still be room for a downside in the equity space. I see. So for fixed income, we've already priced in um, the rate hikes, as Miguel said, about 6 to 7%, and that seemed to be working. Some stability already happening, um, but equities, again, probably we're probably going to feel it more at that area. So um, on that note, and global investing now, because we did cover local with the previous speakers, um, we we see that the peso dollar um, uh, rates where it is, um, the US dollar appreciating. So on that note, is what's the case for global investing? Is Does that give us more of a case to actually go global? Um, so in the medium term, we still see strength in the dollar versus the peso. So this is back, this is on the back of the difference in the pace of uh, hiking rates. We've seen the Fed pivot to a more hawkish tone since the start of the year, but the Philippines was lagging behind. However, recently, government 
Norjok, no, hinted that there could be a rate hike in June. So this could provide some support for the peso in the short term. But we're also looking at the current account of surge in imports from both demand and the actual price of goods could mean that there may be more need for the U.S. dollar to buy these, those foreign goods. So this could drive the dollar up upwards as well. So in the next couple of months, we believe that the dollar strength would still be there versus the peso. So definitely being globally invested would still be good. Um, there can be opportunities, even in times of this volatility. So given a longer investment time horizon, it could be a good time to pick up some investments. Also, being globally diversified is particularly crucial now. We're not all in the same situation in terms of um, country economics. So um, also being positioned against high commodity prices, or also at which stage we are in the uh, tightening cycle. So some comfort some countries may also be uh, more heavily influenced by neighboring countries. So like in the Asian markets, the Philippines will still be highly affected by whatever happens in China. And in the case of a pandemic, some countries reopen faster than others. So that's what we saw with the Western counterparts last year as they um, experienced a strong rally in 2021. So it's good to still uh, diversify globally and reduce risks of being fully invested in one country. Now, um, if you don't have time to pick out direct securities on your own, we also have funds available, such as the Atrium Global Allocation Feeder Fund and the Atrium Global Multi-Asset Income Feeder Fund. So you can leave it to us, Atrium, and our global partners to help manage your investments. Thank you, Kyla. So there is a case, actually, as you're saying, um, there are opportunities both globally and locally um, with obviously um, the BSP, with the BSP's policy rates um, uh, movement we're expecting to move soon. Um, so yes, so thank you also for mentioning some of the funds that we manage. Um, those are available through our website um, in case you're interested to go and start investing while the opportunity still allows us as well. So lastly, um, we last question for you, Kyla, before before we move on to the Q&A. Um, we've noticed, especially in 2021, that both bonds and equities are down. Um, so because of that, what do you think are the next investment themes that are going to be the new it um, moving forward? Okay, so for us, we see um, three themes. So that's don't fight the Fed, the war and soaring commodities, and more in China as well. So for don't fight the Fed, the Fed's top priority is price stability and the what's needed for sustainable economic growth. So to do this, they will use their tools on hand, which is raising rates and quantitative tightening. So with the current situation, they need to be aggressive in increasing policy rates, as well as QT to indirectly reduce asset prices for both bonds and equities. So this would in turn tighten financial conditions, as well as slow down both growth and inflation. So for now, it's looking like the Fed's priority has moved from growth to managing inflation. And the next is the war and soaring commodities. So we're seeing that this war will not be over anytime soon, just like what you mentioned. Although some Ukrainian allies continue to provide support through arms and funding to end the war more quickly. However, in the past, Russian attacks have still triumphed in areas like Georgia and eastern Ukraine. So Russia has actually left uh, uh, troops there despite a military conflict being over. So it's kind of sticky. They still have room to do this as its army is still bigger relative to Ukraine. And we could still see some more sanctions coming for Russia to stop funding for any military support. Although veering away from Russian oil will be difficult and expensive feat as energy supplies have already been tight. So more so, even if hypothetically the war would be over, sanctions would not be lifted right away for Russia. And in Ukraine, it would still need time and money to rebuild. Uh, so food production may not be uh, able to go back so easily. So particularly wheat, it's one of the commodities of concern. Um, this is planted during the winter and spring. And with the war still happening, um, this may not make it in time for, seasonal, for the seasonal planting of the crops. So other nations now continue to practice protectionist measures as well as to manage uh, domestic agricultural prices. So moving forward, we will continue to see elevated prices in both energy and the ag agricultural sector as well uh, as continued supply chain bottlenecks still happen. So for China's zero COVID sanctions and supply shocks, uh, we're seeing continuation of the COVID zero policy and possibility for sanctions from global leaders if we see China to help Russia with this war. So we'll continue to see supply shocks as economic centers would be hit by slow 
movement from stringent COVID measures and in turn China's slowdown could also dampen global economic growth. As an example, Shanghai is one of, the, of China's wealthiest cities and also acts as an anchor to surrounding regions which contribute to about one-fifth of China's, China's economy. The surrounding provinces are large manufacturing hubs for autos, toys, plastics, you name it. In Shanghai, they ask people to stay home and have prevented to people cross the border, border from one city to another. So the closure of roads is an obstacle uh, for, this, for the, sub, uh, the movement of goods. And that's one key to the global supply chain because Shanghai is home to the world's largest container port. So there's so these surrounding manufacturing sites are unable to get their um, shipments to uh, global companies or Western companies like so Home Depot, Costco. So definitely this will have a trickling down effect. So overall, give, given these themes, we think inflation will still be stickier. Supply shocks to have for revenue potential input costs to rise. And with Fed's actions in the next few quarters, we could uh, expect lower growth and inflation. So for this highly volatile environment, we think it's good to store a bit of cash and to be able to catch opportunities when it arises. We also prefer the US dollar cash over peso right now. I mean, it's a continued strengthening for that. And for equities, uh, we expect the more prevalent slowdown. We think it would be best to be more defensive and reduce risk. So stick to high quality names or over small mid caps. A fund that could help here would be the Atom Global Dividend Fund for more defensive and stable companies. For fixed income, for now, we prefer short duration amid the tightening environment and some supply pressures on the local side. However, there may be room again to add uh, more into the portfolio once we see inflation start to peak and as yields look more attractive. So bonds would rally back once the market realizes effects of the tightening and the slowdown starts to materialize. So a fund you can check here um, for global fixed income would be the Atom Global Total Return Feeder Fund. And you can get exposure to a globally diversified pool of income securities. Thank you, Kyla. Um, yes, and given that there are um, still a lot of things to consider um, with these three themes happening, um, and you need to have, um, um, if you can't decide on the pocket of opportunity yourself, um, definitely go through any of the funds, um, as Kyla mentioned, our global dividend fund and our global total return bond fund um, to let us man help you manage, um, again, this quite choppy and volatile market. So thank you so much, um, Kyla. That was uh, a lot of input. Um, and also a very good summary of what's happening globally for us. So um, thanks as well to Carlos and Miguel. Um, we'll get back to you on the questions during our Q&A portion. But before we do that, um, just would like to say that did you know that Atram, as Kyle already hinted, has a wide range of investment products and our capabilities span across several asset classes. So whether that's fixed income, equities, and multi-asset, because um, we understand that we need to service different ob investment objectives of each individual. So with these, it's actually a, with a great pride that we announced that Atram has recently won um, the best investment solutions provider Philippines 2022 from both the International Business Magazine Award and World Business Outlook Award. So for today's session, we hope um, you have somehow um, taken a good lesson and we're helping you with your hashtag taken tomorrow by investing your hard-earned money with an award-winning fund house. And now, um, at this point, I see a lot of questions come in. Um, so we'd like to move on to the live questions from our audience. So um, Carlos, Miguel, and Kyla, hope you can join me back here. Um, and let's go through them. Um, not, not sure where to start. <laughs> There's just so many. But maybe I'll start with you, Carlos, being the first speaker. Um, um, there's a question from the audience. What other positive factors should we look forward to in Philippine equities once the re economy, I guess, fully reopens? Um, and which sectors um, will drive the market recovery? You mentioned a few. Not sure if it's worth reiterating those. Yeah, sure. I think there are a lot of, um, a lot of things to look forward to once the economy fully reopens already. Um, so just to give a few anecdotes, probably one is travel. I think that's probably one of the most obvious since, um, since you this is one of the most battered uh, sectors uh, during the pandemic. So that's one. And just to give you some data on the improvement that we're seeing in the travel sector, for example, for Cebu Pacific, in for, for Cebu Pacific, daily bookings are at pre-COVID levels already. Daily bookings are averaging around 55,000 to 70,000 per day. 
Um, so that's at pre-COVID levels already. Flight frequencies and forward bookings are also at 100% of pre-COVID levels already. And this is a big improvement since back in January, it was only at 41%. Then it improved to 58%. And then in, in March, it became 77%. Now it's at 100% uh, of pre-COVID levels already. And under alert level one, 100% 100 passenger capacity is already allowed. So that's one for the travel sector. And also some anecdotes also on the mall segment, which I guess will be a proxy for, for the consumer spending. So for foot traffic, specifically for SM Prime, during the Omicron surge, we were only at foot traffic of 35%. Then it improved to 65% the next month, then 70 to 75% in March. And then now it's at 80 to 85%. And also in terms of tenant sales in January, we were only at 60 to 65%. And now in April, we're at 80 to 85% already. So I guess those are just some of the things that we can look forward to when the economy fully reopens. But there are a lot more, definitely. Um, for the consumer companies, you can look, we can take a look at their sales um, in, terms of, in terms of improvement from the pre-pandemic levels. So there's really a lot of things to look forward to, but those are just some of the aspects and some of the numbers that we are seeing currently for the, for the travel sector and for the mall segment. And we expect to continue to see, this, to see these numbers further improve as we go on a road to a fully reopened uh, economy. Thank you, Carlos. There are a lot of themes um, that we have yet to feel um, their, I guess, full force, right? So you mentioned yes. travel. Uh, malls, I already see it. Um, been there a few times. Um, and is there any particular, I guess, as you said, there's so many things to look at. Um, and I guess for maybe a starting investor, are there any funds um, that we currently manage do you think that's worth a look um, to capture all of those opportunities you mentioned? Yeah, for the for our overweight on the property in the banking sector, I think that we can go for the um, Soldivo Strategic Growth Fund and the Equity Opportunity Fund. Those are skewed towards the, um, the property in the banking sector. And we also have exposure on the travel sector via Cebu Pacific. So those are some of the funds that we can go to. Yes, um, that would be good because, of course, if you don't have the time or it's just very um, difficult to look at it yourself, um, of course, you can rely on um, some available outlets to do that. So thank you, Carlos. And I'll go back to Kyla. Um, there's a lot of question on global here. Um, so what are your views on the likelihood of a global recession triggered by the Fed's need to go to war with inflation? So again, we're definitely in a situation where inflation is a main concern and the Fed will do that, uh, will do what they can to combat this. But the room for error uh, to do this just right without going overboard is very tight. We're seeing pressures in both supply and demand side and tightening would eventually reduce consumer purchasing power and companies' growth expectations would dampen as well. So there could be a good chance that a recession would be possible if the Fed does go overboard. But they need to do this because inflation at these levels is, is really unsustainable. So we still also have some factors that are harder to control um, with COVID around the corner and a war affecting global supplies. So definitely managing this would be tricky. But if we see some of these headwinds cool down, it can be possible that we may still see some growth in the economy, but definitely not as a fast pace anymore. I see. So um, there's some inflation, uh, sorry, recession um, looming concern, but of course, um, but we're still projecting growth, but not at the pace that it had the last, at least the last two years. So, so good insight, Kyla. Um, that hope that answers the questions of one of the audience. Um, I'll go back to you, Miguel. Um, so there's a question on bonds here. So given what's happening uh, with lots of uh, news, uh, local and global, um, does that mean that bonds will be the best choice um, uh, in answer to or in protection of negative events happening? And what's um, the local sentiment of the market today? Okay, so I'll take that question in two parts, Bell. Uh, first, I think the classical correlation between fixed income or bonds and equity in, in the risk environment, which is when things are risky, uh, equities go down, bonds go up. We've seen over the last few years, outside of 2020, peak COVID, 
is not necessarily true. Uh, as you indicated earlier today, year to date, both equities and bonds haven't done that well, right? But with that said, um, bonds are more stable still than equities in uh, the majority of environments, including uh, the current environment. And I think that given what I mentioned earlier, that the absolute yield levels that we're seeing today are, are levels we haven't seen again since around four years ago, makes an argument for uh, being invested in them. Um, I, I definitely think that 5% for, for five years is a great kind of uh, point to be at for, from an investment standpoint. Um, and if, if, you do, if you can't take the illiquidity of being invested directly in uh, highly concentrated positions in direct corporate bonds, for example, well, we had that great infographic earlier for the corporate bond fund, which allows yes, you to invest. Yeah, which allows you to invest in all these instruments, but still retain that liquidity and that diversification. So yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a case to be made for um, investing in, in bonds, especially coming in now. Yes. So if you're a very risk-averse person, um, of course, the stability that bonds um, propose um, kind of makes sense. And as you said, um, the levels are attractive enough um, for you to shop for opportunities in that segment. And yes, of course, the Atram Corporate Bond Fund, as we showed earlier, makes a relevant case because, um, of course, corporates will lend, <laughs> will follow the where yields are, not to lend um, to, to the investors. And they tend to be more stable also, although more illiquid, more stable. So the fund is actually positive year to date, even though the broad uh, fixed income environment is negative. So it's kind of doing what it's supposed to in terms of stabilizing uh, portfolio. Okay. Good for that, Miguel. And I guess our audience will also appreciate that, that there's a debt available out there for us to look at. Um, and I guess there's more questions as well. Uh, we'll circle back to um, the U.S. Um, so U.S. equities have dropped so much, Kyla. So uh, and energy prices, as you said, also surging. Um, we, we're seeing cryptocurrency interest remain very strong. Um, what what would be then the best approach for investors who are looking for income specifically? Yep. So right now, given where the markets are at, it's, it's still best to be diversified. So the correlation between equities and fixed income has grown in the recent months. So which means that when markets when one market is down, the other one could be down as well. So it's good to have diversified streams of income. So commodity prices could be expected to remain elevated. So an exposure there would, would help too. This exposure may not come directly from commodities per se, but you can also try um, expanding to exporter countries or the companies in that sector. But within the traditional space, you can still try to be tactical. So choose uh, quality for equities. And maybe there could also be opportunity to pick up yield in the FI space. Okay, thank you, Kyla. So there's a, opportunities across the board, um, as long as we, for those income seekers, um, um, just identify which ones those are, and um, so so you get them. So thank you, Kyla. Um, I'll go back. Uh, I'll just circle back to you as well. Um, so Miguel, um, <laughs> you answered this already. Um, uh, oh. There's a few questions on uh, for more conservative investors um, like me. So that's an audience speaking. Um, where should I put my money given rising inflation. Not sure if you can attack this, Miguel, from sure. someone who's just starting because um, it's an opportune time um, and maybe someone who's already invested. Where can they reallocate? Okay. Uh, I guess from a general standpoint, the thing I want to highlight is what you know that Nyad Bell. Now is a great time to come into the local uh, fixed income market just because of where levels are. And we feel that inflation is going to kind of peak soon and probably come off from here. So that also implies rates will go down from there. Um, so we have a variety of funds, of course. And if you are looking at something that can try to capture the upside more as rates go lower, then you could invest in something like the total return peso bond fund. The caveat is, because that fund is very market determined, if the market is bad, then uh, it, it also can, we tend to reduce the downside, but you follow where the market is to a certain extent. The corporate bond fund, as I indicated, is positive in a negative market environment. And it was like that for the full year of 2021 also. It was positive at, at year end in a full year negative environment. And it's really because that strategy does cater to a more uh, conservative and longer term investor base. The, the downside is that because it's not as active in the market in terms of trading, when there is a very strong upside, you don't capture all of it. 
but I think I can say with some certainty, well, we can't guarantee, but I can say with reasonable certainty that you don't have to be afraid that your investment is going to go negative in that strategy. The conservative investors in here, um, there's a total return on if you're willing uh, to trade a little bit or if you want real stability, uh, probably not going to get as much upside, but positive. Um, the corp um, and Carlos, um, Kyla actually touched on how commodities kind of make sense in this um, in this situation and environment. What are your thoughts short term? Um, uh, the prospect of the low, particularly the nickel and coal producers. Um, and lastly, uh, so that short term, medium to long term, what's your thoughts on renewable sectors, maybe like ASIN and ASIN? Yeah, sure. On the short term, I think coal producers and um, coal miners will definitely benefit from the higher higher metal prices right now. And that is what we have actually seen in terms of the stock prices of for example, perfect example would be um, SCC, Semirara, and Nickel Asia. They have really gone up since the Russia-Ukraine war. So to your point, yeah, definitely short term, I think there's going to be some upside in terms of their earnings, probably declare special cash dividends because of the higher cash flows that they're receiving due to higher metal prices. So that's definitely something positive for the, for the coal producers and for the local miners here. Now, on the, on the other front, um, uh, by the way, just to add, I think that for the rest of 2022, I think from an earnings standpoint, will be good for the local coal producers and the local miners here. So now to move on to your second question, what will be the outlook for, for renewable energy producers? I think the outlook is very bright there. Uh, we have what we call the renewable portfolio standards, which, which um, requires that 35% of our energy on a consolidated basis be sourced from renewable energy. So of course that would benefit, that would benefit um, renewable energy producers such as ASEN, um, SPNEC, and even it's prompting the other, the other power producers to shift, um, shift to the renewable space because of that. So I think there's a lot of potential, um, not only in the short term, but in the long term for those um, renewable energy producers. And that is probably why we've seen a good performance last year for, for example, AC Energy, SPNEC. It's also now at 1.6. I think the IPO was around uh, one peso. So it's really because of that. It's really because of the outlook of the um, of these renewable energy producers to be very optimistic given the renewable portfolio standards that requires 35 percent of our energy to be sourced from a renewable energy by 2030 already so i think that's the main thing right now i think we lost bell back there but uh i'll just uh, continue on with the questions thank you for that carlos so uh Next question is actually for Miguel. No? So Miguel, uh, where do you think will the average uh, peso dollar exchange rate be for this year, 2022? Oh man, the thing everybody wants to know about and the hardest thing to talk about. Okay. Um, yeah, I think what we've seen is over the first quarter, the, last, the first four months, we've seen the dollar peso trade with it between 52 to 52.50. 52.50 being quite a significant technical level that we've been unable to breach. Um, and back today, we're actually back at around the 52.10, 52.15 area, right? After having just been closer to the 50 the other day. I think that volatility is going to persist. Um, our year-end uh, target from, the macro, from our in-house macro team is actually quite dollar aggressive. Uh, it's at 53.75. But I, I want to caveat that with that level assumes that the Fed hikes that we were discussing earlier actually come to pass, right? So maybe two hikes from the BSP and actually like a six to eight hike move in actuality from the Fed by the end of the year. Now, if that happens, I do see that 53.75 coming because as we know, one of the greatest determinants of the exchange rate is the interest rate differential, right, between the U.S. and the Philippines. Um, that being said, 
it still remains to be seen whether or not the Fed is able to raise interest rates as aggressively as we're forecasting right now. So 53.75 is the high end of the range. I think that we'll break out of this 52.50 area relatively soon over the next two months uh, as the Fed, as the Fed uh, raises again. And then I think for the year, we're probably going to average in the midpoint within 52.50 to 53. Now, by year end, I do expect to be above the 53 level. But again, whether we are at that 53.75 top end remains to be seen based on how aggressively the Fed is actually able to raise rates. All right. Thank you, Miguel. So a lot depends on how the Fed will hike rates. Okay. Thank you very much. The next question I have is for Carlos. Carlos, uh, it was mentioned that the property sector will be one of our growth drivers. So uh, how will this influence uh, REIT valuations? Yeah, I think we're, we're more positive towards the sponsor companies. The sponsor companies meaning RLC, uh, SM Prime, um, Ayala Land. I think we're more bullish towards that rather than the REIT companies simply because of, simply because of the nature of, of the instrument itself. For REITs, they're fo mainly focused on, on, on office leasing. And for the property companies, you know, they have exposure to the residential segment and on the mall segment. So I think what I was referring to would be the sponsor companies, you know, the RLCs, the SM Prime, the Ayala Lands, the Robinsons Lands. Um, so I think they will be more, they will benefit more from the reopening theme rather than REITs. So, yeah. All right, so the reopening play really has a big factor you know, in the valuations. All right, uh, I think we're down to our couple uh, last few questions. For Kayla, how has the Global Multi-Asset Income Fund adjusted in relation to the current themes you have mentioned? Um, so for that fund, um, it's still leading more towards the DM side. So before the tightening actually happens, so it's just um, continuing to juice out all that savings uh, um, that was uh, collected in the past two years. But um, what they what they're doing now also for the fixed income side is that they're leaning more towards credits or high yield versus versus IG government bonds. So they're trying to pick up more yield um, just to come back um, the, the sorry costs also. Um, also, they're trying to be tactical on the way that um, as soon as they pick up uh, that they see inflation peaking, they'll be starting to add uh, duration as well. Thank you very much, Carlos. Hi, uh, Carlos Kayla. <laughs> right. Uh, last question. This is for Carlos. That's why I said Carlos. Why has the Alpha Opportunity Fund gone down substantially lower than the PSEI? What strategies and forecasts do you expect by year end? Yeah. So before we go to the Alpha Opportunity Fund, if you're talking about the forecast for the PSEI, it's at seven thousand eight hundred. So that's a thirteen percent upside from these levels, and um, that's premised on a seventeen percent earnings growth. Now we go to the Alpha Opportunity Fund. Yes, um, it has been challenged lately in terms of performance. And that's mostly because it is invested in small and mid cap companies, which have greatly underperformed. So in, a, in, a, in generally what we're seeing, for example, when the market first went up in, in Feb, we, I think we went up to around 7475, a broad based general recovery would be more focused on the big caps rather than on the small and mid caps. And that is why we've seen the Alpha Opportunity Fund underperform. And also another thing is that um, the Alpha Opportunity Fund actually performed uh, really well. I think it's the number one fund last year. But now, um, given, given the very high base, the stocks that were the, were the biggest winners of last year's were now underperformers this, uh, this year because investors have now taken taken profits uh, from those winners last year. And those were the same stocks that the Alpha Opportunity Fund holds. So, so I think it's more, of, it's more of that. It's more of profit taking from the winners last year. And it's also more of the big caps outperforming the small and mid caps. So that probably explains the, the performance of the Alpha Opportunity Fund for this year. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. No, yes, I did remember that it was the best performing equity fund. No? Uh, last year. So, all right, I think uh, 
that's all the time that we have for questions. So before we wrap up, we would like to ask for final words from our speakers. Uh, how about, can you go ahead, uh, Carlos? Oh yeah, um, sure. I um, just wanna thank everyone again for, for attending this webinar. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, on the equity space, we expect a lot of volatility right now. And we have seen this kind of volatility recently. But um, I just want to give a message that um, please stay the course. Um, don't panic. I think that these are opportune levels to invest in the market, to invest in our funds, uh, because we still see a lot of fundamental drivers for this market, such as the reopening story, the 70% earnings growth that we're seeing for this year, and our 7,800 target, which is still a 13% upside. So there's still a lot of things to look forward to fundamentally for this market. So just stay the course and keep on investing when the market continues to go down because I think in the long run, the positive sentiment will continue to be there. Thank you very much, Carlos. Stay the course now. All right, next would be uh, uh, Kayla. Any last words for our audience? Yeah, I agree with Carlos uh, with staying in the course. Um, it would be better to think more long term than uh, to panic in times of uh, volatility. But during these times, it'd be good to find opportunities as well and to be also globally diversified, but also to still be wary of some risks. So keeping some cash at hand would be good also. But again, also um, use of cash to be ready um, to attack when, when possible. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kayla. So diversify and keep cash in handy. All right, uh, lastly, uh, from Miguel, last words, please. Okay, thanks, Jerome. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to repeat the what Carlos and Kayla said, right? But just to add on to that message, it is a good time, we believe, to add into whatever strategy you're looking at, both fixed income, equity, or multi-asset with a global inclination, just because would you rather buy the market when it's expensive which is what we were all worried about doing five years ago when we were looking at the PSC at 8,700 and bond yields so low. Or would you rather buy it now after things have kind of completely shifted where the markets are so cheap in comparison? And the only thing that we're looking at is for a shift in sentiment before things accelerate, we think, pretty quickly. So I guess it's that. Do you consider this an opportunity or not? And we do. So thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel. So yeah, this is actually a very good time to come in. No? Time in the market. Okay. So once again, thank you very much to Carlos, Kayla, and Miguel for that comprehensive market outlook and for sharing to our audience your insights for the upcoming months. Now, did you know that for as low as 1,000 pesos, you can already jumpstart your investment journey? Here's how you can invest in Atram Funds. Good day. If you are interested in investing with Atrum, the leading independent asset and wealth management company in the Philippines, please visit our website, www.atrum.com.ph. We have all the details you would need to know about our funds. If you would like to start investing, click Invest Now. For further assistance and account opening, you may email our client services team. If you have more questions, visit the website's Frequently Asked Questions page or Atrum Academy page. We hope this helps. Thank you. There you go. If you have any further questions or would like to learn more about Atrum, please visit our website www.atrum.com.ph. Again, if you have any friends who you think would like this webinar but are unable to attend, feel free to share the YouTube replay of this session. This, uh, visit our YouTube channel Atram Studio. Scan the QR code to visit our official social media pages. We would also like you to invite. We would also like to invite you to join Atram's official Viber community group, hashtag Atram PH Community, to stay updated on the latest announcements, advisories, and reminders. Scan the QR code or visit the link found on your screen and get a chance to win Atram merchandise. Lastly, please answer the survey at the end of this webinar. We would love to know your thoughts on today's topic. On behalf of everyone at Atram, thank you again for your attendance and participation. We wish you and your loved ones continued health and safety. Have a great day.